Hello. Hi, Kristen. Hello. Hello, hello. How are you? Sorry, still figuring out the computer here. Hi. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Dana. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I, I have a feeling it's going to be not so bu super busy today and very intimate. And that's good because I'm fighting a cold and I'm winning. <laughs> but um, if I, if I sound a little uh, congested, that's because I am. And I'm sorry about that. Um, how's everyone doing? Pretty good. Kristen, you just joined, right? Yes. It's so nice to put a face to a message. <laughs> yes. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I wanted to give uh, people a few more minutes to join. So do you want to just chat for a little bit about what inspired you to join the program and about your family and your kids and how it's going? So my daughter has she kind of developed eczema a little bit later in life and it, around six, but it was really pretty mild. And then just, we moved from Texas to Michigan three years ago. And I don't know if it's just the increased cold weather or if something else just kind of spawned it on, but it's just been kind of very difficult to manage. Um, especially in the winter months, the summer months, she does okay with the sun and everything, but the winter months are very, very hard on her. So we are just trying to figure out what we can do to get to the root and get a reset and all of that good stuff. So, so far I'm learning a lot. Your program's really, really wonderful. So thank you, thank you. for doing it. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, what, uh, why did you decide to kind of go outside the realm of like a conventional approach? Well, I've always been more natural minded ever since my kids were little. Um, we've not ever done vaccines. They've hardly ever been on antibiotics. Um, so steroids and all of that was very, I was very hesitant about it. And then I truly feel that when we first started using some steroids, I think it just made it exasperate when it would flare. And I, so now I feel like Oh, I should have never started steroids, but this is where we're at. So um, she hasn't used any topical steroids. She's never been given oral steroids, but the topical ones, the last time she used it was in October, but it's also the last time it was managed well. So it's been a long journey and we're just really trying to seek out answers. And we have a dermatology appointment next week, which I'm not exactly looking forward to, but I feel like we just have to kind of hit all of our bases and figure out what we're dealing with here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Uh, just if you're just joining, we're just giving, uh, we're just doing some hellos and giving uh, some people a little bit more time to come in. Uh, I wanted to say a few things, Kristen, about steroids in general and the conventional approach for everyone listening. Um, there's nothing wrong with using conventional med medicines as a bridge, as a temporary measure to calm things down, to allow the body to kind of de um, uh, stop a cycle maybe that's that keeps happening uh it can, it can break something it could be a nice bridge these are life-saving medicines uh there's nothing wrong with using them the problem is if that's the only solution like if you need to rely on steroids or even now to pick some it's becoming more and more used which is is it works in a similar way it's not considered a steroid it was used just in adults for many years and now it's approved for kids but everyone is excited because it's not a steroid, but it, it they do the same thing. They just work on different pathways to calm inflammation on the spot. And Kristen, you mentioned that it worked well in October when you used steroids, when things were under control, of course. Uh, but why we're here, it's because the problem keeps persisting. So if you continue to rely on, on steroids, and non-steroidal similar item similar topicals or injections that are non-steroidal but do the same thing you kind of can get into this loop where that's the only thing you're doing so this is a good supplement to what your dermatologists are recommending and on that note i just want to remind everyone that i'm not your pediatrician unless you're i don't see any of my blossom pediatrics patients i have a practice in new york and in new jersey it's called blossom pediatrics um and I know some of you are new, so I just wanted to say hello. Um, I do have a practice, 
most of the kids that come to my practice, I put them on this exact protocol. I send, you know, they take, they have this course going, they have this exact protocol going for a while before we do any kind of testing, any kind of like extra measures. Um, and so, so even with my kids in, in Blossom Pediatrics that I am a personal doctor for, I still don't say like, don't use any steroids. There's nothing wrong with using these medications. The goal is for you to be able to go to your dermatologist in like, um, I don't know, three months or whatever that follow-up is. And they could start weaning things down. And it really depends on where you started, right? Like if you just uh, were using steroids for a year, it's going to be a very long wean. You don't want to just stop a steroids, especially abruptly. So the goal is to have a pathway to get out of the cycle of needing um, medications to control symptoms only. Nothing wrong with it. These are amazing bridges. I'm a conventional doctor too. My background is in hospitalist medicine. I use conventional medications all the time with myself, with my family. They're life -save antibiotics are life-saving measures. Sometimes you do need to use antibiotics for your child that might have impetigo or another skin infection. Life-saving measures. And the goal is to get back to a place where the body is able to heal itself and, and not be constantly flared by everything and triggered by everything. So thanks for the, uh, um, thank you for sharing, Kristen. And I hope this little spiel <laughs> is a common question. And I know a lot of you are new. So I just wanted to kind of uh, point that out. Also, uh, because I'm not your pediatrician, I always recommend asking your own pediatricians and dermatologists and allergists about specific advice for your child. This is just general educational information that I've compounded after working um, in this setting for over a decade. So um, that has helped my patients and has helped thousands of kids through this program and variations of this program as well. So uh, at that note, I'm going to start with um, the lesson that we I have here for you today. Um, and then we'll do Q&A. So I, would, I know there's so many of you that are new. You could keep your camera on. You could keep your camera off. Uh, and because we have so many uh, families that recently joined, I just wanted to do uh, like a, a little bit of an intro of the different parts of the program. And for those of you who haven't logged in in a while, um, I really want you to be able to get a little reintroduction to everything as well. So the, the eczema rescue program consists of different parts and you can use all these different parts in any way that you feel is right. Um, the goal is for you to pick the, the ways that you like to learn and be inspired and consume information that speaks to you. You don't have to do everything and you don't have to do everything perfectly. And you don't at all need to read everything that I write because there's a lot. So the first part of the program is these live calls. Um, there is a calendar link that I sent to you. It updates every month. We do live calls at different days and different times. It's two educational teaching sessions like this. Uh, right now it's twice a month and then there's Q&A and you could ask about after that. Uh, right now they're scheduled back to back. I do them sometimes these lessons like in the morning, sometimes in the evenings. I know you're in different time zones with different family obligations. So I try to mix it up. But if you miss a live, you can always rewatch it. They're posted inside the digital program and they're posted inside the group. Just give me a few days to post it because I have a team that edits out um, extra stuff uh, and put, makes it look nice. <laughs> so, um, so you have a calendar. I suggest that you use that calendar link to automatically add it to your calendar if that's how you function. Um, then, so that's the live calls. So there's a teaching session. This is where I teach you the most impactful things that you need to know. So even though I'm not your pediatrician, it's like the same kind of conversations that I have with my one-on-one -on -one patients when I sit down and I'm like, this is what you need to know. Forget all the fluff. We're all really busy. This is what you need to know. Then there's the digital program. The digital program is like your textbook. And I just wanted to show it to you um, because, well, because it's like a textbook and there's a lot of resources there. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, there we go. Okay. Do -do -do. Okay. This is, can everyone see this little, okay. Um, so, whoops, I'm going to wait, show you all the different parts. So when you, when you first come into the program, you'll see different, it might look a little different for you, but you'll see different 
uh, mo like modules. The first is the start here program intro module. If you're just joining, please start here. Uh, this is where you'll see a welcome video about me. You don't have to read all, you don't have to listen. You don't have to read any of that. The program outline and then the live teaching schedule. So if you click on the live teaching schedule, this is important because if you scroll down, you'll see an actual calendar. Um, and then you could subscribe to the calendar and that's going to go straight to your calendar, like on your phone and your computer. This is really helpful. So you don't have to keep checking when the next live is. So if you could like go, these are the previous lives and so on. Um, these are the lives that are specific for us in this group. These are the zoom calls. You might have, um, found me previously inside the eczema rescue club which is an open forum and sometimes i go live there when i go live inside the eczema rescue club it's always like a facebook live so you could always join of course um it's kind of like just having different kind of guests there but it's not necessarily speaking about the eczema rescue program so just keep an eye out is this like a, if i send you an email about something is this for like a zoom live for the eczema rescue program or is this a facebook uh, Eczema Rescue Club Facebook Live, so you don't get mixed up. And I apologize if it's confusing. I'm trying to figure out a better way to do it. Um, and I'm I think I'm succeeding by telling you this. So then we have going back to the pro program introduction. We have a lot of content here with the eczema, the epidemic of chronic childhood illness. This is like a pretty lengthy article if you really want to get into why your child is having this problem and all the data that we have you could read about that the soft sign assessment I highly suggest you do this before you make any changes it looks at all the different parts of your child's system like everything so we're not just dealing with eczema here we're dealing with the whole body and eczema is just how the inflammation the blocked detox pathways the um the the immune response that's inappropriate, the the gut health, that all comes out in our kids as eczema. It could is eat just as easily come out in our kids as asthma or allergies, which already is happening to a lot of our kids. So the soft sign assessment is for a, a way for you to really take a look at what's going on in the whole body, not just the skin. Save this assessment. I'll show it to you. There's a little video that you could watch. The videos are pretty short. Um, there's instructions on how to do the assessment and all the downloads that are referred to are always on the bottom. So if you open up this soft sign assessment, um, you fill it out online or, or print it, and then you make sure you save as, because it doesn't save automatically. It's long, so it'll take a little while. It's long. It's like 15 pages. It's not absolutely necessary, but I suggest you do it now and in maybe like 30 days and then in 60 days or so. Um, it will really help you understand whether or not the changes that you're making are how they're impacting your child. Are they just impacting eczema or are they helping them in different ways? So let's go back to the actual course. Uh, most of what we'll be discussing today and most of what you need to be doing to focus on is the is your child's quick success path. This is where this is the four week program, the original program. Uh, where you could really focus, this is where you have the most impact, working from the inside out to help your child heal. It's divided into four weeks. Uh, you don't need to do it in four weeks. You could do it in six months. It really doesn't matter. It's just an option to do it in four weeks. Everyone's coming in in a different place. So it it's like a nice four-week program that you can do because that's how it's laid out. But the truth is, is that for some families, you could stay in week one for a long time. The goal is not to stress your child out. There's a, a summary video that you can watch about everything in those four weeks. And then there's like a lot of content. Each week has a lot of content. You can watch the videos on top, which are short. You could look at the downloads. Um, you can, yeah, you can, you can just kind of focus there and each week focus on something specific. Today, we're going to be speaking about what you really need to focus on to give you the most impact to work on gut health. And that is so important to, as the foundational step to reversing eczema permanently. Uh, then those four weeks. And then after 30 days, you have a few options. So one option is to reintroduce some of the foods that you might have eliminated, like dairy, gluten, and minimum sugar. Uh, but if your child is not better, you can go to the My Child Is Not Better section 
and consider histamine overload. If you already know that your child has a histamine issue, then just take away, just go straight to this histamine overload section and take all the histamine overloaded products away from the beginning. Okay. Then there are modules on trends on the outside in approach, transforming eczema prone skin. Um, each sub module has a lot of lessons, detox baths, air quality. This, this is a very, very thick textbook. It's being turned into a book. So um, don't be discouraged if you can't get through all of it. You have really, it's intended to be like a six month program. Next week, we're going to speak about histamine. So, and then there's like a lot of different live teachings that I've done that I uploaded for you here, but itch relief, just all sorts of previous lessons. Okay. Then the, the third component is uh, the private, the closed eczema rescue program group. Um, this is where I answer your questions in between live sessions. Give me like 24 or 48 hours to answer questions. I try to get to all of them. Sometimes I'll refer you to specific modules for specific information, like the, like, you know, a list of things inside the digital program. So those are all the different parts of the program. Let's get into why we need to work on healing the gut as the most foundational, most important step that you can take to start the process of reversing your child's eczema permanently. Um, this wasn't the case uh, 20 years ago uh, that gut health was such a big issue. We have data, we have research, we have technology that helps us understand why we're, our kids are suffering from issues related to things like dysbiosis, to, which is where the microbiome is not balanced, is not diverse, is not healthy, and um, um, uh, gut lining that is leaky, which allows a lot of different large molecules and particles to get into the bloodstream, causing severe, severe allergic reactions. The number of kids with eczema in the U.S. and in most developed uh, places in, in the world has been skyrocketing for the past 20 years or so, and especially in the past five years. It's it's uh, it's really concerning because it's, a, it's indicating a bigger problem. So maybe in the past you went to your pediatricians, they said your child will just outgrow it, but your ki kids are no longer outgrowing it. You have almost as many adults as kids that have eczema. Uh, to right now, the last data that the CDC published, and I'm not sure why they haven't released any data in the past few years at all, but it's about 12% of kids with chronic eczema and about 10% of adults with chronic eczema that never outgrew it. And this is why it's a really big problem. And what we're doing is we're making sure that we're taking the steps to to make sure our kids outgrow it faster, not just leaving it to a very small chance for them to outgrow it. So uh, why is this happening? We have so much data pointing to the fact that it's the gut health gut health in everyone in, in in is suffering so much but the good news is that you can do so much to heal it so naturally it doesn't require really any fa fancy testing that's optional it doesn't require a lot of supplements it doesn't have to be a crazy approach and it doesn't have to be stressful so i'm going to explain to you what you need to do in which is all in weeks three and four, really, to heal and seal the gut lining and um, and rebalance a healthy and diverse microbiome. The things that you need to do is to repair the gut lining. The cells of the whole entire gastrointestinal system from mouth to anus, uh, they are very delicate. It's a one cell layer thick, like one cell layer thick lining and on the outside is the outside world, and on it's one cell, and on the other side is blood vessels, and that's how everything gets absorbed into your child's system that is nutritional. So sometimes you have absorption through skin, uh, sometimes, but nutritionally, you have absorption through this one cell layer, thick endothelial lining. I'm going to get a little nerdy sometimes. Because we have multiple generations of... um. Um, of of families of kids of people having antibiotic overuse and not really restoring it all the chemicals in the environment many many different factors uh not having a lot of fermented foods and diets a lot of glyphosates in the environment that actually destroy the gut lining all the preservatives etc i could go on and on about all the things that we were doing wrong for the past 50 years 
because of this and because b- babies are being born a lot through c-sections also babies are being born with gut linings that are leaky already that's why you're having so many kids now that are at one month, two month of age, already have eczema. This is actually a very new phenomenon in medicine. This is not normal. This is not something that we saw like even six years ago when I started working holistically with eczema, I did not see so many babies with this problem. Uh, and that's that's why repairing the gut lining and making sure that cell layer, it doesn't have leaks in it. So things are not getting into the system, overwhelming the immune response completely, causing all of these allergies. Uh, environmental food allergies, seasonal allergies, all of the allergies, all of the all of the sensitivities, all of the problems with digestion. We need to repair it quickly. The best way to do this is through food. So uh, I cannot find any solution that is as effective as making sure that your child has an ample supply of the actual ingredients that your gut lining is made of in their system. And that means stocks and bone broths. But where do you start? Let's say you have, this is for kids who are over one, and then I'll speak about kids who are under one, okay? Um, For kids who are over one, you want to start with something that is very easy to digest. Usually kids like it, uh, so it doesn't taste very bad. Um, It's easy to make, and that usually means chicken stock. And I know this sounds very, very, like, obscure, but chicken stock, it's a traditional, it's, it's in I think almost in every place in the world, in one form or another, stocks have been used to heal the gut lining always. And it kind of fell out of popularity. But this is a very traditional and very time and again proven way to start repairing the gut lining because that's exactly what your gut lining is made of. Those ingredients, the collagens, uh, the amino acids. Now, (coughs) the kind of meat the kind of poultry, the kind of fish that you're using does make a big difference. And I say start with chicken stock because I think that kids like it most. Uh, If they're like not used to drinking it, uh, they're more open to it um, because bone broths are are harder to make. They just take a long time to make because you have to source really high quality bones. It's like the next level. Um, You can get almost as much benefit if you make a chicken stock plus whatever choice that you choose it has to be something that you can do. So chicken stock is a great place to start. Use high quality salt, uh, not like salt with iodine, not salt, like table salt. My favorite two salts right now. I used to just say it's Celtic sea salt, but I also like Redmond's. And um, Star West Botanicals is the third actually that I'm recommending right now after doing a bit of research on salt. Um high quality mineral salt, the Celtic sea salt is the easiest to find. Just get the fine ground. They has a ton of minerals, which our kids really need. How much chicken stock do you start with? Start with, it doesn't have to be a large quantity. So if your child is like one to three years old, a cup a day is amazing. Even a half a cup a day is amazing. If your child is like school age, like school aged, you could do a cup to two cups. There's no maximum. There's a minimum. Okay. A minimum is a little bit, but what really makes a huge difference is daily. So you, you want to have your child have a stock or bone broth every single day, optimally on an empty stomach. If they're like completely not into it, you can use it to cook with. You can use it to cook with, like if you're making rice or soup or Anything that absorbs liquid, quinoa, anything that absorbs liquid in your food, throw that stock in there. Don't use water anymore if it's absorbing. Not if you're going to strain it out, but you want to have as much of these stocks in your in the, in your child's system as possible. Uh, you can put vegetables in there, uh, celery, carrots, onion is really helpful. Garlic. Uh, I have a ton of recipes of how to make it, whether it's stock from any animal product, um, not venison, you can't really um, make stock of bone broth out of it, but like beef, veal, um, fish. I have all the recipes inside the digital program in week three. Just want to point out that it's the quantity. If your child is sensitive to histamine and you already know this or you're suspecting it, and next week we'll talk about histamine if you're just joining, then make it fresh because histamine builds up if you leave something in the fridge over time. Um, And 
stocks have a lot less histamine than bone broth. Now, if your child is into it, if you're into it, if everyone likes it, the taste is great. Excuse me, your child is like fine with drinking stocks every day. You can go up to bone broths, which are a little harder to digest. They have more histamine, but they are also very, very healing in different ways. Mix it up. Use different products. One week fish, one week poultry, one week could be a meat, beef. It doesn't matter. High quality ingredients. So local, um, lo you can go to your like local butcher. You could go to the farmer's market. Make sure that the animals are, if it's a fish, it's wild and not farmed optimally if it's if it's um if it's a uh poultry you know you want poultry that has been free range farm not not just conventionally raised um if organic means that the the animal was fed organic food uh, feed which is very very helpful because a lot of the feed um in what they feed conventionally farmed animals like regular non-organic is really, really bad for you and ends up in your child's system. Like the GMOs and the corn and the soy uh, is, is it, it's not even worth it. You might as well just not have stock if you're going to make it with ingredients that are not quality. I don't recommend using pressure cookers that make things really fast, but I know that pressure cookers also, like if you're making a bone broth and the boil is like 12, 18, 15 hours, um, sometimes pressure cookers are used if you do a pressure cooker on a slow setting or like a clay pot, like an electric slow cooker, that's just fine. If you're trying to make it really fast, it's going to destroy all the ingredients that are helpful and beneficial. So don't do it. It's not worth it. If you find yourself having a hard time making bone broth, the only brand that I have found that doesn't use pressure cookers in a in a way that is not conducive to nutrient value is brodo b-r-o-d-o which you can buy online they'll ship it to you frozen if you're in um the new york new jersey area fresh or maybe outside now whole foods carries it fresh direct has it if you that's how you're shopping um you could get get it from them directly you could get it from their website it's b-r-o-d-o so uh frozen is fine you can make big batches and you can freeze them just make sure you freeze them in glass and don't freeze something that's hot it'll melt your whole entire freezer if you store stocks on bone broths in the fridge make sure that you're storing them all the way in the back and not in the doors it'll last a lot longer so every single the most impact that you can get from food in this stage of healing to heal with gut health is stocks and bone broths Second most important thing that you can do is to restore the microbiome in the most natural way possible. Um, I think that using different kinds of fermented foods, especially lacto-fermented foods, like sauerkraut, if your kids like spicy things, it's kimchi. Um, it's a lot harder to have a lot of kimchi every day because it's so spicy. Uh, but sauerkraut is really basic, easy. You can make it yourself. You could buy it very easily. Things like beet cloths, fermented carrots, fermented cucumbers, not pickles. Um, fermented, any fruit could be fermented. Ferment anything. A variety is helpful. If your child has a very sensitive stomach, has been on a lot of antibiotics, has a history of constipation or diarrhea or belly pain or any sorts of like um, gastrointestinal problem if they're just very sensitive in fact for all kids start really slowly because these are so potent ferments are more potent than and really any um probiotic that i could think of in general in terms of colony forming units it not only is helpful for restoring the microbiome but the actual nutrient uh uh, avail bioavailability, the way that your body is able to absorb nutrients is so much more powerful when a food is fermented because it's pre-digested. For example, um, cabbage has a lot of vitamin C actually, but when you ferment cabbage, there's like 10 times more vitamin C that's available for your child's body than, than regular uh, cabbage that is raw or even cooked. Also really important. Um, we want our kids' bodies to digest everything properly so they could absorb all the nutrients that they need to heal. And they could, that's why in weeks one and week two, if you go back to that, we remove all the things that are not serving our kids. And then we give them a lot of nutrients from like, like, um, 
juicing and smoothies and making sure that the produce that we're getting is super high quality, local, sustainable, organic, has dirt on it, picked when it's ripe, that's really important too. So I um so I really think that ferments are top notch, but they're not for everyone. So you always have to start really slowly. You don't want to go too fast. The worst thing that'll happen is if you give a lot of ferments that are very powerful to your child or to yourself is that you're going to have something called a die-off reaction. And a die-off reaction is when uh, the, all the bad bacteria that shouldn't be in your child's system uh, kind of die off very quickly. And that can cause diarrhea and vomiting and upset stomach temporarily. It's not dangerous. It's not lethal. Nothing bad will happen. Uh, but it is uncomfortable. So if you start slowly, your child's body will slowly get used to having those beneficial microbes. Um there's really nothing more powerful than ferments, but it's not for everybody. For kids who are very sensitive to histamine or if you're suspecting histamine overload or if you're just not sure, go uh, when you have a moment to the histamine module. If you can't find it, there's a search bar inside the program and you could just search histamine and you'll find it there. Go there and see what symptoms are you looking for to kind of predict histamine. Uh, if your child is not able to tolerate histamine if you're not sure if your child is like completely against ferments if you trying to kind of like speed up the process you could always get a probiotic i don't think that probiotics are as potent really unless they're very specific to your child child's needs so it's kind of like shooting in the dark the probiotic that i love the most right now especially for kids who are sensitive to histamine is smidge sensitive it is not cheap it is expensive that's why i don't love it but it's not intended to be used for a long time. In fact, I don't think the probiotics should be used, the same one uh, should be used for more than like maybe max three months, uh, but really more than a month because it'll do what it's doing. It's going to restore what it needs to restore. And then you're just wasting your money. Don't just buy probiotics randomly. Um, most of them are dead. Okay. And if you want to learn a little trick on how to determine if your probiotics are worth your time, energy, uh, the time it takes to give your child a probiotic. Uh, I mean, all of this takes time. So is to do the milk test and that's in the digital program under week four of how to do that. So I really like smidge sensitive for kids who are histamine sensitive. And I really like Claire labs for those kids who are not histamine sensitive. If you're looking to really super boost the whole process of restoring the microbiome on the topic of supplements, the third supplement uh, that if your child is not really into stocks and bone broths and is not like kind of getting into it and it's hard to start, there's also a supplement that helps heal and seal the gut lining. Um, it's it's a, it's a powder. Uh, it's by Claire Labs and it's called L-glutamine. And I'm sorry, one second. Okay, um, it's L-glutamine. You can... It's a powder. It works really well. Um, it's not going to do the same quality of work as stocks and bone broths, but it is going to be very helpful as a nice bridge. I don't recommend using it for like more than a month, truly, of really any supplement for more than a month. Um, the So those are the options. The last option is to do the tiny health test. If you ask me a year ago, like, would I recommend any direct to consumer as I'm a functional medicine pediatrician and I use functional medicine tests to help bridge that gap between like where we are now and what we're trying to do for the future. How do we really supercharge the decisions that I'm making for my patients, that patients are making for their kids, families are making for their kids rather. And so a year ago, I would say the technology is not there. We we have all this data, but we're not able to interpret it as as physicians, as people. It's not there yet. Well, I have. I'm so happy to say that the tiny health test is very very helpful. So I would suggest actually spending that extra. It's a two hundred dollar test. It's a poop test. It, the results come back to you, and then they give you very specific information on what's going on with your child's health. On top of that. They tell you information about histamine, which is unheard of, and it's excellent. So if you see a lot of histamine, that's going to help you really narrow the choices that you're making. That test 
takes about six to eight weeks. You can pay extra to expedite it. Start with this program. I work with them directly to help formulate eczema um, plans for my patients, for their program. So, so it is highly recommended that you start with, don't wait for the results to start making the changes. Don't wait for the results. Uh, don't wait for the results to start a probiotic if that's what you need to do. Don't wait for those results. But um, if you really want to like go, it's not necessary, but you can, you do have that option. And it is a test that I do recommend. And it is the only test that I recommend uh, for families to do. Uh, and I have a $20 coupon. So it's like 180 instead of 200. And um, I'll post inside the group one more time what that code is. The link in the code to give you $20 off, just 20 bucks. Um, so those are the steps that you need to take. I, if you want specific information, if you're looking for discounts on some of these supplements, it's all inside the digital program. And what we covered today is the main information in weeks three and four of the quick start ex conquer eczema program inside the digital program, but you can go and you can read so much information about it. If you're curious about any of the things that I just explained to you. So uh, I know that there's a ton of you here. If you just joined while I was speaking, welcome. If you missed anything, I'm going to post this video um, once it's edited in a couple of days inside the group and also in the digital program. Uh, I'm going to take a few of the questions uh, inside the chat box and then you could just unmute yourselves or raise your hand and I'll call on you um, and we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. Tracy said, my daughter loves Brodo. We got it when we started the program. Tracy, I'm so happy to hear that. That's why I like it too, because Brodo is pretty delicious. Um, uh, most kids for bone broth, it's like the most delicious one. They have different options. You could pick any of them. Um, uh, Maggie said, have you tried Bonafide Provisions Bone Broth? It's local to where I live. Is that a good brand to use? Last time I checked, Bonafide is excellent for their ingredients. It's organic. It has It's well done, except they use pressure cookers. So the nutrients die off. And I can assure you that a lot of the nutrients die off because in medicine, when we have kids who are very allergic to almost everything, we have parents use pressure cookers to make the food so um, cooked up that it's not even recognizable by the human body as food and they're not reacting to it because the body doesn't recognize it as food. So in one way, like that's that that's great. And in another way, this is not what your kid needs. What your kid needs is nutrients that look, that are whole nutrients, the amino acids that are not destroyed. Eventually everything gets destroyed but enough pressure and heat. The amino acids, the collagens, all those things that you could find in a powder that I don't recommend getting. And I don't recommend getting powders uh, of these things of like bone broths. And I don't recommend anything like that that is shelf stable. Um, so Maggie, I mean, unless if you want to look into it, if they don't use pressure cookers anymore, maybe um, it's something else, uh, let me know. Uh, Kat said, why do we not learn any of this in school? Oh, I wish we did because I was a pediatrician for years practicing. I thought what I thought was amazing medicine, uh, following the best practice guidelines that were laid out to me by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And the reason we don't learn about this, even as pediatricians, as doctors, is one, there is no mention of root cause medicine in conventional medicine education at all. So it's a it's a it's medicine that is intended to reverse uh it's, it's life saving medicine and it's medicine that like your your regular doctors they know how to manage symptoms. If you really think about everything that was ever prescribed to you, it's either life saving or managing symptoms, and that's not what we want to do anymore. We don't want to just manage your kids' eczema anymore. I could go on and on about this, but um, but I can't because we have very important questions about our kids. Uh, Adiana asks, what's the name of the test? Missed the name. It's called Tiny Health. Yeah, th thanks, Kat answered it. And um, check out the, I'll post inside the closed group, the coupon code um, So and the link so you can get it a lot cheaper, 20 bucks cheaper. Uh, Silky asks, are we shooting for 100% of the tiny health results? The, does that even exist? 100%. Uh, Silky, I'm not sure what you mean by 100%, um, but maybe you can... Clarify. I mean, like, 
I mean, like, um, you know how when we get the results back, it says like 50% good flora or, or it has that bar. Like, does it help? Yeah, great is question. It? No, we don't want 100%. No one is okay. 100%. We're not looking for that. What we're trying to do is optimize. the. What we want to do is what uh, changes can we make for our kids that will make the biggest impact for them? And so, so you'll get results. How it works is you'll get results first. And then you'll be confused like Silky is today. And then uh, then they'll send you an um, expert report. That expert report will tell you exactly which probiotics to start with, like what changes are the most impactful. And that's what you're going to follow. And like what's nice to do, but not really absolutely necessary. And I love that they're very eczema focused. That's why we collaborate because they're really on a mission to reverse eczema. Like the goal is to have this kind of test available for all kids who have eczema in conventional medicine. I am on that platform. And this is what, what I think is really the future of medicine, especially in today's world where so many chronic illnesses and autoimmune illnesses are based in the fact that the gut lining and the microbiome is so disturbed. Um, let's see. Um, VJ, I will call you in a second. And uh, Ariana asked, my daughter is, is four. What? Would the test would still would the test still be helpful? I noticed that the test is marketed for th zero to three year olds. Uh, Ariana, the test is actually good for every age, including adults. They're they're just the first ones that are very specific to kids, including a, especially a four year old. So they market it for babies because that's kind of the direction that. But it it's excellent for every age, and the results are based on age. So absolutely 100%. By the way, they also, I don't know why they don't market it more. They actually have a test to the, for vaginal flora, which I think is so important if you're planning on having another baby. And like the big question is like, what can I do to make sure that my next baby doesn't have this problem? Is focus on your own gut health, restoring your microbiome. And one way to test this is to test, is to do their, their vaginal flora test. Um, so great questions, everyone. I'm going to call on the people who very kindly have been waiting with their hands up. Uh, we'll go from there. So you could ask anything, really. Uh, I'm going to, or, or Vijay, I'm going to unmute you. I know you had a lot of questions today. Yeah, okay. Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 doctors. Yes, yes. So, so my daughter is 3.5 years old, three and a half years old. And lately from last six to seven uh, weeks, she is itching a lot. Earlier, she had some skin viral. Dermatologist said, no, it's not viral. And it, there was some confusion, but it, it's, it's cleared out. But still, she's still itchy in the night. I don't see her skin is as bad what it was before three, three four weeks when it all started. But I don't know if she is doing out of habit or she has a histamine overload. Okay. So what is my first question is like, how can I find that she's histamine overload? I saw two tests you have mentioned in, in that histamine video uh, inside the module. Uh, but first one, I when I read online, it was more related to asthma. And second one, I don't know, is it is it like, will I be able to convince my pediatrician to write that test, uh, blood blood work test, how, how it will go? I think I wrote this, these tests are available, but not, not very reliable. When I, that video that I did a, yeah, like, yeah, a year yeah, ago, yeah, yeah, I wrote yeah. these tests are available. They're not reliable. Tiny health, right. tiny health now has histamine on their test. Hmm. That's reliable. This is kind of new. That's why I didn't update it. Technology is moving really quickly. I'm so happy uh, because, so that's reliable. Another way, another very reliable way is to remove all the histamine rich foods and all the histamine releasing foods from your child's system for like two weeks and see what happens. That's even more reliable. Okay? Yeah, I did but, that. But I don't yeah. recommend, yeah. like, uh -huh. it's, it's like hard. You can't just like remove everything. Mm -hmm. Kids who are growing and already limited in what they can have or can't have, right? So that's an option um, is to minimize histamine. Another option is to use a supplement, like maybe minimize a little bit. It's not an all or nothing with histamine. It's having a lot of histamine in the system that, that throws it over the edge. So having just a banana usually won't, usually won't be as bad as like having five bananas and then ferments. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there's like allergy season outside and then histamine gets overloaded and then you see symptoms. Eczema is just one symptom of 
um, histamine overload. So there's a supplement. Uh, it's it's basically kidney ground. You could give your kid kidney, which nobody does, cooked kidney from animals. This is where most, or you could give them the supplement to see if it helps. It helps a lot of kids who are sensitive to histamine. Um, and so, so there's there's ancestr there's a, a kidney supplement that is on my full script dispensary. It's a capsule. You open it. You sprinkle it on food. It's just ground up, cooked. It's basically kidney cooked, dried, ground up. Um, you could give that to your child, and right before they eat, like fifteen minutes before they eat something that is rich in histamine, and see if they're better. Uh, and I also want to point out that you mentioned that she got better like three, four weeks ago with the actual skin inflammation. Correct. Right, right. Okay. If she had that, but now she's better from last two weeks. Okay. But in between, I use steroid steroid cream, like whatever um, a pediatrician has prescribed. Yeah. But but her overall skin. So she had two things. She had eczema, patches flared up. Plus her her skin was very patchy, like goosebump kind of things, and and all red and all, and that was super itchy. So okay. I think that that is that is now all clear and eczema because I applied uh, steroid also now it's in control. So so but she still feels itchy. Now I'm struggling to figure out is it out of habit where mm -hmm. she wakes up in the night and and it starts itching all around her body. She just removes her clothes and starts itching. Versus I don't see her skin is that bad what it used to be like three weeks back where she was really feeling itchy. So I'm trying, I'm struggling, like, should I go with hastimi overload route or should I first clarify, uh, cl uh, check that out if she has a hastimi overload and then go with hastimi overload route? Okay. What I want to say is, um, right, as when skin starts to heal, it always itches. So you might see your kid's skin less red, less inflamed, less broken, less dry, Right. Uh, yes, yes. But they're itching a lot. This is one of the most classical things that happen because when skin is reforming and healing, it's going to itch. Think about it like um, if you have a really bad cut, if you ever did, and then skin mm -hmm, is trying mm -hmm. to heal and close, it's yeah, going to yeah, itch. Yeah. So it's really hard to right, see right, right. now. I, I say um, leave it alone and see what happens in a couple of weeks. That This process of skin healing for some kids it takes mm -hmm. a few weeks and it's not it's more common mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than not to have when mm -hmm. to have itching uh when skin is actually healing and better i'm glad it's better um yes it could be habit this might sound um this might sound like a little you know you could take this advice or leave it but right. i really think uh -huh. that if you if regarding habit of itching for it depends on the age I think it's worth a try because it's like it doesn't hurt. It's changing the way that your child falls asleep, changing their environment, maybe get new pillows and sheets and blanket, uh, maybe make the room mm -hmm. a little cooler, make sure that the sheets and mm -hmm. blankets are very, very breathable, like not hot at all. Heat might make it worse. And then maybe have them listen to like a nighttime meditation before they fall asleep. There's like okay. A, okay. Okay. like on YouTube, on, on my favorite app called it's like timer you can search uh -huh. kids sleep 10 just have them listen to it that allows yeah, right, right. i know that yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. go into a different pattern that they normally would i think that might help uh, other kids are helped by um uh weighed blankets for sleep so uh -huh. weighed blankets uh -huh. are heavy blankets and so that extra pressure on the skin is what they need uh -huh. to not want to itch it so much that helps a lot of kids too okay Okay. Okay. So, the, so two things I understood. One is like just wait for a few weeks and and do uh, do all these other other remedies you mentioned. And second thing, should should I still go ahead with tiny health gut health? Yeah. At I least it, so. it won't. Right. It's, At least I'll get available. some information. I think I'll, I'll buy it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll buy it. At least that will give me some direction in case she has a histamine overload. Yeah. And about. And about starting probiotic, I was thinking to start probiotic. So should I go with that sminge one, which is for hastamine? Yeah. Or even if she does not have hastamine overload, I use that. It should be okay, right? Yes, it's great. It's it's a really good one, especially for eczema. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Then I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one also in parallel. 
and see how how it goes i do have other question but i'll let other to go first uh, i already took so much time so if nobody i will ask later the other okay. question thank you mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. um monique hi i'm just going to unmute you can you uh hold on yeah, hi, hi. how are you good how are you good thanks um so i was curious as to so you know genesis we've been doing low histamine diet um <laughs> very limited choices on what to eat mm-hmm. and she like her skin is healing and at the same time it like flares back up in specific places and then it goes down and then it comes back up and it's it's red like and she's still itching i think some of the itching is coming from healing like there are patches that are like really healing and then they're so i'm curious as to why that would happen and then the other question i would have is um I'm breastfeeding her. Like, do I have to stay away from high histamine foods too? Does histamine travel through the breast milk? I would stay away. Yeah. (laughs) If that's possible. Mm -hmm. Um, Why is that happening? Uh, Healing is never linear. It's, it's like, if this is time and this is improvement, it's always like up and down. It's not linear. It's almost always two steps forward, one step back. But what you're looking for is like, are the flares not as long? Are they not as severe? Is does she have longer periods of time with improvement than not? She's sleeping better, so it's it's hard to say why it keeps going back and forth. Um, a simple method would be maybe switch like maybe baths if you're doing them, like what you put in a bath that might help a little bit. So like, let's say, do you do baths for her? Uh, mm-hmm. detox baths for her hey, apple cider vinegar okay try dead sea salt okay that, that could kind of change the environment on the skin a little bit try baking, mm-hmm. baking soda is a really nice one it's for all, mm-hmm. everyone if you if your child is getting better and getting better and then there's like a little flare the skin is changing she's more itchy um Arvija too try try go back to the basics and the basics are put something in the bathtub now if there's worsening don't use it anymore you have a lot of options there's a whole guide inside the digital program called detox baths um that you can use switch it up see if that helps the ph on the skin the microbiome on the skin itself um restore and heal a little bit better okay thank you you're welcome do you have any other questions did i did i answer it i don't know um well i also maybe need need a little bit of hope (laughs) But uh, I'm like, how long does she have to eat like this? If it's an actual histamine overload, I know we're waiting on the tiny health to come in. And um, when did she? When did you send it? Last week. It'll okay. come back sooner. Than, let me know when it comes back. Okay. The um the first they send it in two parts, and it should be back. I just got mine super fast. I don't know how. Um, but the the first part comes back pretty quickly. The mm-hmm expert report comes back slower like after a while so so send me the info when it comes back okay Okay. we'll go from there let's wait before we decide it'll be back we'll get a lot of info okay great thank you thank you um lauren hi hey lauren let me just unmute you hi can you hear me yes Hi, Dr. Guzman. Um, it's so it's it kind of is related to that other woman's question. Um, my uh, my daughter who's who's six, she has been healing very nicely. We eliminated gluten, dairy, and a lot of sugar, and I feel like she's doing great. Um, but she's still and her eczema, like she's really cleared up but she still has this constant itchiness and it's it's funny because that woman brought up habit and my daughter is six and I sometimes I feel like it is habit um like if if when she's under pressure like if if each asks for a question she starts to itch her arm and yeah but she does wake up in the middle of the night with this intense itch um and even if even during the day when she's doing her homework and she'll like, she doesn't have eczema on her neck anymore, but she's like clawing at her neck 
And I, 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 you know, I, I did discuss with you the, the yeast, the candida overgrowth that we saw in her uh, Genova stool test. And I actually, I did receive the tiny health test. I just haven't performed it yet, but I, I received it to do for her as well as myself and my husband, because I was curious about us too. So, but um, I wanted to ask you, so if this candida yeast overgrowth is causing this constant itchiness, um, I really, you know, because I had spoken with you that a doctor did say, you know, to, to do fluconazole, the anti, but I really don't want to go that route of like mm -hmm. pharmaceutical drugs. I'd rather go the more holistic route. Um, I read about, uh, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but sac. The Cremyces boulardii. Yes, yes. The beneficial yeast. Yes. Yeah. So if that combat can <coughs> de Yeah. Uh, so there's not as much data on it because, so you have data. So candida is a yeast and it's very much a problem for a lot of kids in their gut health, right? Like if it's too much and... um. So there are a few in general in, with candida, with any bacterial overgrowth or yeast overgrowth or viral overgrowth in the whole body, you have really two options to three options to get rid of something, whether it be candida or anything else. Okay. The first option is to kill it. So that's the whole world of conventional medicines. We have a lot of studies. We can't in conventional medicine and regular medicine prescribe medications unless they're well tested thank goodness right we don't just want to prescribe things that are not effective so we do best practice guidelines based on research and data and studies so fluconazole is one of the most classic common nor very very safe in general anti um antifungal medications that could be used in the mouth for oral thrush on, on the skin and the gut like everywhere right um we have a lot of studies that show, well, this is very effective to kill yeasts. Diflucan is another word for it. It's used for all sorts of overgrowth of yeasts and fungus. <clears throat> so one way is to kill it. If you're killing it, you're going to kill everything else that's a yeast. By the way, we speak so much about the microbiome going good bacteria, bad bacteria. But it's not just bacteria. It's good viruses, bad viruses. It's viruses and bacteria that can be... Um, pathogenic, hurtful, or be beneficial, helpful, depending on the environment that they're put in. So it could be like either way, kind of neutral. They could be bad for you, pathogenic, could be good for you, the ones that we want to restore. Uh, there's also yeasts. And we often were like, yeasts are bad, yeasts are bad. We want to get rid of all yeasts, all fungus. But really, there's a lot of really beneficial yeasts and in our systems that help us ward off the bad guys. One of them is called Saccharomyces boulardii. Okay, so the second way to get rid of the things we don't want is to have a lot of the things that we do want. And that's why we use probiotics so that the and ferments and to create an environment where there's just no space for the bad guys to be. So this is like a very, but I don't have a lot of data behind it. So if there was like a suspicion of a, of a, of a, of a, of a candida overgrowth, I typically do start with just, you know, if it's not like obviously there and really not that bad, and maybe you just have a kid who has like thrush all the time, I do recommend starting Saccharomyces boulardii. You can make ferments from it too, by the way. And it's a beneficial, uh, it's a beneficial yeast. But if you're going to be on Diflucan, what's the point? You're just going to kill everything anyway. So we don't do both. And then the third way to get rid of something in your child's system that is alive and we don't want it there is to starve it. Just don't feed it anymore. And that's what you're doing, Lauren, when you removed sugar. You, uh, Candida thrives on sugar. You removed so much sugar, it's going to eventually starve. The last two ways takes time. The killing it is pretty fast. Okay. Yeah. And and my pediatrician, because I spoke to her about the fluconazole, the diflucan. And she is very, um, you know, I, I has yeah, because she said, um, and it wouldn't just be this this particular uh, functional medicine doctor I spoke with you about. He didn't just recommend it for a week. It could be 
months, mm-hmm. months of her to be on it. And my pediatrician is so against that. She, she does not want her on this. It, one week is, is fine, but to be on it for months, it, it gets metabolized in the liver and she's very, uh, she doesn't want it for on it for months. So I, I don't know if you, I have only prescribed it once for a child with eczema. It worked really well. It was for three weeks. I cut it down to three weeks, not m- m- a month. Uh, okay. Maybe two weeks, two to three weeks, something like that. It is a lot. You have to kind of choose which, rec- you can't go, you can't, you have to choose one one route or another. Regular pediatricians, this is not standard practice. And I obviously re- respect her hesitancy, of course. And personally, like I don't recommend it unless things are really, really bad and you've tried everything else in general. So you kind of have to go with it. We could talk offline about it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's see. Okay, thank you, Lauren. I hope that helped. And we'll yes, it's- the convo um offline. Um in case you're wondering about the offline, um Lauren's a patient of glossy yeah. pediatrics. <laughs> so um okay. <laughs> Let's see. Uh Kristen, do you wanna go next? I think your hand was up next. I'm gonna unmute you. And you can be on camera or off. Hey. Hi. I actually just have a couple quick ones. The first one is in regards to um, detox baths. My daughter, she was actually just sitting here watching and she said, you know, when I take my detox baths, it makes me itchier. So she only uses Epsom salt and baking soda. Um, I don't know if it could be that. And she says it's fine when she gets out of it. It's just when she's in it and it's only the areas that are most affected by her eczema right now like her flare areas okay yeah so instead just do one like just try like baking soda that usually doesn't okay. and then cut the dose okay okay uh and okay. wash it off too yeah she does do that and then she's fine afterwards it doesn't create any further itching and then um my other question is because i do suspect that her dermatologist is going to want to put her on a steroid next week how do we do it safely since before she only ever used it as a last resort and she would only use it maybe for a day or two just to get everything to calm down and then we wouldn't use it so now that we haven't used it since october i am a little nervous about that and how can we do that safely so when you have a conversation with your dermatologist ask them what can what steps need to be taken like when can we do a follow-up to wean her off or okay. Like what, what's make, make sure you mention like I, the last Short thing term. you want is like, here's the steroid, use it forever. Bye. You don't want right. that. That's not, that's not best practice. Like that's not, I, I really don't think that's fair to, to families to have a prescription for everlasting steroids to use forever. And even though I'm not your rec pediatrician, like, I just think that this is very poor practice to have kids on chronic steroids forever with no plan or attempt or the guidance on how to wean so i want you to ask how do i how like can we stop after x when can we stop when can we reevaluate whether she needs a different dose because like one steroid is like double the strength of the other one it makes a big difference um wait how can we mean it just ask about that okay like i want you to have like a plan for her like can we wean it off slowly can we do it every other day can we you know, how do we know when to stop? Right. Those are important questions to ask. Yeah. And that was always our hesitation to use it because there was really not good instruction on how to use it other than just when it flares up, you can use this. And so we would always wait until it was like, okay, I can't stand it anymore. Um, but then it would, you know, and use it for a couple of days. Yeah. And I didn't know if that was making things worse. And every time it would flare back up, it would be like a bigger spot or a bigger spot or any place that she used it seemed to get more and more inflamed after a couple of yeah. months right of it act of it going back to and now I feel like we're in a way worse spot than we were when we first started using it <laughs> so so you need that's why that's why you're here because it's inside out right approach right like yes for some kids very for some kids you just need it once a year for a couple right. of days we're not this is the not the place for those kids um if you don't stop the process from the inside out of what's causing eczema 
flares in your kid, you're going to end up with the same problem when you stop the steroids, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, but this approach takes time. Yeah. So in the meantime, you can use the steroids, but once the trigger is stopped, the inflammation decreases, you'll be able to wean them down okay. yourself. Um, the goal is not to get into a place where you have topical steroid withdrawal. Yeah. That happens for different kids at different like in, in situations. Uh, for some kids, it could be like a month. For some kids, it could be a year. And then there uh, a lot of conventional medicine doesn't believe in it. Yeah. Like it's not a thing, uh, which boggles my mind. Like it's only a thing. Actually, what they actually write for physicians, and, like this is the advice is uh, topical steroid withdrawal. I'm going to like summarize it is how I understand it. Topical steroid withdrawal is not a diagnosis. It's misuse of steroids. So if a doctor prescribes steroids to be used every day, but parents don't do that, then you can have symptoms of eczema, but it's not withdrawal. What? <laughs> what does that even mean? Right. Like, it boggles my mind. I cannot believe they wrote it. It's just kind of crazy. And um, so having breaks in between, it prevents those kind of issues. And I, I don't, you're not there at all. So. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, Kat, Hello. Thank Hi. you. I feel like I'm meeting a celebrity. This is exciting. Um, I have on the, on the topical steroid withdrawal, we had like the conventional, we're switching doctors. We have a great naturopath now, but they were like, take the steroid, put it on. And it wasn't getting better. And I, I think it was after he had a ton of antibiotics because he had some really bad ear infections. So we were like, shit, we got to do it. Um, and our naturopath said it. So I said, okay, if you tell me, I'll do it. And and then he had that, oh, what was that called? The that bad flare up of impedigo. Oh, and yeah. yeah. That's what it was. And then, so I think we used the topical steroid for too long. It was just like 1% cortisone, but his poor, like this chunk of his skin just seems so angry still. And I was wondering, is there anything we can do to help? Or is it just aquaphor till it gets better or? Uh, so let me just get this straight. You were on steroids for a while, even on the face, right? Probably like a week and a half. Oh, oh, that's not that bad. Okay. So steroids for a week and a half. Then he got impetigo. He got, he had the impetigo first, first and they, okay. they said they made us give him antibiotics for that and yeah. said, put this stuff on it. Okay. Uh, and now it's still very, very, very inflamed, right? It's it's not as inflamed. It's just like kind of red and dry and crusty and just, you know, I'm like, please stop itching all around your mouth. So was is that where the impetigo was on the face? It was more up here. That's going to take a little while. So it's... Uh, um, impetigo, by the way, if you don't know, is an infection of strep infection uh on, on the skin and it has to be treated uh because it's spreading the, but these bacteria like impetigo staff they're everywhere they live on skin normally and naturally right so why are our kids with eczema so prone to them is because skin is broken and the bacteria can very easily get underneath so there's nothing like everyone has this bacteria naturally normally living on everyone's skin everyone um uh in different variations and different amounts but kids with eczema have broken skin. When you have broken skin, the defense mechanisms are down. They get inside and it could spread really quickly. So yes, when you were suspecting a serious infection on the skin, you always have to treat it with conventional medicines. It's right. like life-saving measures. They prevent hospitalization and the spread of this bacteria. You did everything right. It needs to be treated. And I don't recommend ever treating things like impetigo with like just colloid silver or whatever it's too dangerous and i'm just speaking to you from a person hey a person that works in a hospital setting and i treat emergencies kids are hospitalized for these things it's really dangerous i'm even though i'm very holistic antibiotics are terrible they're not terrible for saving lives right 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 so, so now what you do to heal that sp space is um Maybe consider, uh, do you use any kind of like soaps on? We on have like the Dead Sea soap. Okay. Just 
don't use any soap. Don't use any cleaners. Let the skin naturally create its own oils again. Okay. Don't even wash it. It's the face, right? Just yeah. a little water. That's it. Okay. No okay. more soap. No more. Soap. I have, by the way, on the topic of soap, uh, I have so many families that come to me who are like, I only use water to clean my child. Yeah. Hair, skin, and their skin is like perfect. Okay. They do not smell. Everything is great. Uh-huh. It is great. So you great. don't need to use all the soaps. Um, I think especially on the face, all you need is water. Yeah. That's good. Okay. By the that way, is. just like to put it into perspective, I personally only wash my face with water uh, unless I put makeup on, one, which is like once every three weeks. Okay. Only water. I hate everything else. It is else. so good. Yeah, it is so so anyway, not a deviate. Just saying that okay. this will stop the stripping of the oils that are um getting recreated after so many, especially on the face. We don't typically recommend using steroids on the face for that reason. Yeah. Very delicate skin, and yeah. it is very easy to destroy the natural barriers, which it did because he had impetigo. So just let things come. Uh you could use aquaphor, especially before bed. Okay. That's it. Try okay. it. Let okay it, and in it. the same kind of vein when you do have the antibiotics is there anything we should can do to help boost his insides back up um i do recommend for you to do the tiny health gut test but yes the ordered a million times oh yeah i ordered for it those of you who are coming like who heard me talk uh, i don't know like a year ago i'm a whole different person now because their technology is incredible now Easy. and so but in the meantime uh, start heavy duty probiotics. Okay, we have the Clear Lab ones. Yeah, already. like like start slow, work your way up to like double the dose. Oh, okay. For like a few weeks, but you have oh, to start great. slowly. So because he was on antibiotics orally, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that is so helpful. And my last question, which might be dumb, but we are getting the tiny health any day. Hopefully, great. we've already cut gluten and dairy in the last week because we're just. I mean, nervous and anxious. Should we keep it cut out or should he eat all of the stuff while no, he takes it? Keep it cut out. Keep it, okay. keep it dairy, the gluten for like a month or so. Okay. And do the tiny health while it's, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank the, you so the dairy much. The, you're welcome. The dairy and the gluten won't really affect the tiny oh, okay. health much at all. There's a questionnaire that they ask you about what supplement is your child on? What's their history? It's very thorough. And it'll ask about diet as well. Oh, I'm so thankful for this test. Me too. I just did mine for my kid and I was like, I didn't expect this at all. So, wow. Yeah. Well, it's, information is so helpful. <laughs> Thank you for this. I really Thank appreciate it. You're welcome. And uh, if you have other questions, you know where to ask them. On, inside Thank the you. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Paula, hello. Long time no speak. Hi. Can you hear me, Paula? Uh, okay, I'll get back to you. <laughs> if you can hear me, say hello. Okay. Um, Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Hi. Wait, we just hello. unmute. Oh, hello. Hey, How are you? Hi. Good. While... Um, so I, my question is, um, so I don't want to throw into too many things at once, but, um, have you found that with some kids, um, is there eczema related to maybe mold or something with their house? Because, and I don't know, like, should I get my house tested? And then how could I even confirm that that's where my son's eczema is coming from? Because I, I mean, I am, I've been doing gluten-free and dairy-free even before I found your program. And because a friend of mine recommended that, and um, I've been doing that for like probably two years. And I saw a significant um, decrease in the eczema in his face. But I was just getting frustrated because I was like, I want it to be completely gone. And it's just never been completely gone. So that's when I found your program. I've been doing the bone broth. Um, and he's had a little bit of a cold. So I don't know if that's why he still has it. but Or maybe it's just going to take months. I don't know how long it's going to take. But so my question is, should I wait a while or should I go down the route of saying, well, maybe it's mold or maybe it's this or um yeah. it, it, so for kids who are allergic to mold it could be mold okay it could be mold 
mold by the way is mostly like is in the home but it's also in a classroom setting very often mm -hmm. like in schools mm -hmm. um big time um okay. i don't i can't really say so too much about mold there's like so many different companies that use different technology mm -hmm. that i just can't like i can't even point you in the right direction so if there is like a local company that could come and check for you and then and then remediate that that's always good because mold okay. is bad for many reasons uh -huh. um, so that's like one route and it does take time to heal so he's better so you're on the right track and mm -hmm. maybe doing a gut health test would be also very helpful to kind of see you what last steps need to be taken like what's what else what's that missing link between complete resolution and today okay because I do I do want to do the tiny health I'm gonna yeah. do that too. I think that's that's like more important than mold okay and so if you're like kind of worried about it you can actually maybe get an air purifier a really good one for mm -hmm. the room with HEPA filter um okay Air Doctor is excellent. Excellent. I love mine. It's just okay. fantastic value. Fantastic. Air purifier. Okay. And what do you what do you know about also um like maybe a, a dehumidifier? Because I was just noticing another thing is my house is just I happen to just get this, I have this thing that measures the reading of our and it's saying like almost like 68% or something like that. And then I was reading, well, that's really high because the windows they get um a lot of dew in the mornings and I don't know I just feel like maybe I just have too much humidity in my house too I don't think that's a problem it's usually that's not a problem not, it's usually not a problem that's not a pro okay because so I'm, what what happens with eczema is like moisture is lost from the skin to the environment that's why so many kids I'm a little jealous of your humidity so oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh very often for kids who are like in the winter northeast or northern parts of the u.s mm -hmm. uh, i have to put the put humidifiers in the rooms I recommend that because it's too dry and right that's why so many kids have flares in the winter because mm -hmm. it's too dry and you mm -hmm. want the humidity to be like up to like 60 percent even okay so bad where okay. do you live? in san diego I don't think that too much is the issue. That's too much is. It's not good for bed bugs. Okay. Sorry, not bed bugs. Dust mites. It's not dust good for mites. dust mites. They grow in those environments. Okay, and he, the dermatologist, did say he's allergic to dust mites. Oh, okay. In that case, get a dehumidifier for the bedroom and make sure that you do acknowledge the dust mite allergy and put covers okay. and everything. Get rid of uh all the stuffed animals. The mm -hmm blinds the rugs mm -hmm. super okay. sanitize wash every sheets mm -hmm. and get covers for pillows in the in the um mattress that's really okay. important yeah that's mm -hmm. if you haven't done that that is really important okay all right but like getting a dehumidification for the whole house is not worth it maybe just in the bedroom where just the dust mite problem could be okay all right. And um, one last question. Um, so I've always been concerned about my younger daughter because I was like, oh, I really don't want her to have eczema too because my son has eczema. And um, just in the winter, I've noticed she's always been a thumb sucker. She's two. And I've noticed she just has like right here and right here. And I'm thinking, well, she sucks her thumb and maybe it gets wet and that's all it is. But still, there's, you know, the part of me that's worried because I'm like, oh, the like kids can still catch eczema at two or later, even though my son was younger when he caught it. So how do you know whether it's eczema or not when you see something like, like, it's just very little, just right usually, here. Around. It's usually it doesn't start around the mouth. It's usually in the, like, the uh, folds of the body, like the neck, the here, um, okay. behind the knees, behind the elbows. Okay, neck. that's how my it's son usually, was. Yeah, it's okay. so around the mouth is usually not the case, but if to get a diagnosis, you need to yeah see a doctor. Okay, all right. I don't. I don't think it is. I'm just. I don't know. I just thought I would ask because I've just been paranoid. I just really don't want her to have eczema. Also, so. I get it. Maybe do the tiny health test for her too to like optimize okay. the system. Okay, if this that's what I would do if I were you. Okay, right. preventatively. Mm hmm. And just one last question. Um, do you think so? I mean, if 
it could take months, right? Um, or up to a year, just the cl- complete clearing of his eczema. He's better? Well, he's better. I think he's better, but I don't know. At this point, it's it's hard to say. I feel like in some ways, he was better in the summer, like more like September. And and I don't know if maybe he just the winter is not a good time for him. Was he going to the beach a lot and swimming? Or is he still? Um, I don't know. I just feel like... I don't know. Maybe it's just the with the winter. Are some kids is some kids eczema worse in the winter? Most. Okay. So Most. I think that that's what it is. That it's just uh, make sure his vitamin D levels are adequate. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, make sure that he's not over bundled, like mm-hmm. in the winter. Like a lot of the eczema flares in the winter are from loss of humidity and also mm-hmm. being overheated because they're okay. bundled up. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but. That's usually the case. There's <clears throat> there's a module called Winter Proof Your Child's Skin. Okay. Check it out because okay. there's like a whole download, like a whole uh, many different things you can do mm-hmm. and uh, a video to watch. There's mm-hmm. a whole um, little ebook that I made about things you can do for like winter time. And okay. um, I don't know if all of it applies to you because you're not in like the cold tundra. Mm-hmm. It is pretty humid. Uh, but yes, healing does take time. It's sometimes it's a few weeks and sometimes it's a year. So okay. I wish I could tell you exactly how long your child's journey is. And mm-hmm. But I'm glad he's better. He's better, yeah. But... <laughs> right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's see who else has questions. Let me just... Oh, here we go. Um, Irvija, do you... Do you want to ask your other question? I think we're... Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it's related to detox bath. So um, I, st- I, I I give my daughter oatmeal or baking soda bath. And, and when she takes the bath and when she comes out, her, her patches are really red. Uh, she doesn't complain anything specific, but then, uh, then I apply the lotion and uh, all other things. It's okay, but... Like throughout the day, it's okay. But after, as soon as she takes bath, I think it's without detox bath also. As soon as she takes bath, the patches are like so, so red. Is it normal? No. Okay. So it could be a few things. Number one, the water that you're using could be very irritating to your child's skin. If it's public water, it might have a lot of chemicals to clean it, like chlorine. So you can actually check the water quality in your town by going to the environmental working group website and searching for the Mm -hmm. water guy like there's like a water um, Uh guy uh and you could actually see Uh what's going on in the water there are and i use this there is like a berkey and then that's hard to find aquasana is another brand that makes filters for the shower they're amazing they get rid of the chlorine it makes a big difference uh, something else is that you're you maybe you just want to have your child do a quick bath with just water and that's it and not sit in the bathtub. Okay, no detox bath, right? Just, yeah, like if it's not better from it, then don't use it. Just have them rinse with quickly, not too long. You know, sometimes that could be very dehydrating for skin. You don't even really need to use soap in most places, to be honest. Try that. Right, for- right. Yeah. I- Okay, okay. And for detox bath, if I want to try, should I? So I start, I did like four to five detox bath and I see the same behavior. Every time she's out of bath, her patches are like, I feel like, oh, she has so much eczema. Versus oh, yeah. like in morning or, or, or on, on th- throughout the day, I feel like, oh, she's getting better. You know, that kind of thing. And so I, I thought, it. okay. And don't do it. Okay. I would, uh, if, if there was like one, one, advice I could give everyone it's not possible that's why it's so much trial and error and I know it's frustrating it's frustrating for mm-hmm. me too. Uh, but everyone's microbiome on the skin is different genetic comp- de- composition of skin is different the reasons are a little different a lot different so uh, so you have if it's not working the detox baths don't try to don't 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 do it all right okay. mm-hmm. All right. Uh, Paula, are you there? I was, are you, I'm not sure if she's there. Paula, Paula? Okay. Dennis, hello. Denise, York. Hi, can you hear me? 
Um, yes, we can hear you. Hey, good morning. Hey. Um, how long should the detox bath be? I thought they should be just um, short. So um, they could be longer, they could be shorter. So how do you, how long should you do it? That's the question. For kids who are very sensitive to winter, like in the winter time, they get a lot worse when the weather changes and suddenly they're having like eczema flares. The benefit of short baths is that you don't lose a lot of like pores open. When you get out of the bath, <clears throat> you could lose a lot of moisture. So for those kids who are very sensitive to winter time, to moisture loss, short baths. For those kids who are, it doesn't matter what weather it is, what season you're in, what temperature it is, what humidity level it is, you can do, and they're okay taking long baths, then you can do them longer. So 15 minutes is fine. To get really the most benefit of a detox bath, it's 15 minutes. But for those kids who can't even, like, for some kids who can't sit in a bathtub, you can actually take a spray bottle, put like, baking soda in it, spray the child down, let let it sit on the skin, and then rinse them off. That's another option. If you don't, because sitting in the actual hot or warm bath is going to dry out the skin. And so you have to figure out what's best, what work, works best for your kid. You'll know right away if it's, if your child is worse after a, a bubble, a bath, then shorter, just rinse them off and go. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, one more question. Yes. So we are in the program now for about three months, two and, yeah. two and a half months, and uh, following it pretty strict with no gluten, dairy-free, and so on. And um, he never had the eczema so bad as in the beginning, but it came back again and again, especially when he is has a cold or when he's teething. Okay. That, so yeah that's very common so uh any stress so wait i just have a question uh, uh in general is it better like if he's not sick or not teething is it better uh, i would say it is better okay uh for kids having stress on the body is a trigger massive trigger for kids his age a stressor is usually teething or having a cold. Uh, almost always you might have a flare with a cold in a child, not really in adults or older kids, but like in little kids when they're teething. Try uh, for teething homeopathic remedy. Like, mm -hmm. have you like the homeopathic chamomile? Um, we have something with chamomile. It's called Osanit. It's something from, from Germany, but it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So homeopathic for teething to kind of support the system uh i don't know how to stop teething or colds uh um, but i think homeopathy also, works really well for somebody his age yeah and um, but when the eczema came back um it's is, is there oh. some, something we can do to kind of push it back because our feeling is we we if it starts breaking breaking through, we just can it it gets slowly or worse, but it's getting worse. And then there is a point where we have to use a hydrocortisone to kind of push it back. It feels this is the only way it works to to get it to pushing it back. How old is he? Almost one. Eleven months. Okay. Um. So. I would say boosting the immune system is great. So increasing the amount of vitamin C rich foods in his system. You can't use a lot of supplements in his age. Okay. Like he's under one, your hands are tied, but nutritionally maybe going really high up on the vitamin C rich foods to help support the system, making sure his vitamin D levels are excellent. And if not supplementing, that will also help, um, mitigate any inflammation that he might have from teething or having colds so that the immune system is not like overwhelming over overwhelmed do you do you get what i mean when he turns one your pediatrician are is um possibly going to do like a regular blood test ask them to check vitamin d levels and if they're low you can supplement and that will help the immune system not have such a difficult time when he is exposed to a cold i think that's the Probably your best bet. But um, with, with this age, he, he is too young for juicing, right? No, you can have him juice a little bit in the food. Yeah, a little bit. 
yes, he could have it's, juice. Yeah, uh, like if you're making we, it yourself. Uh, yeah. We, we started producing also about one or uh, one and a half months ago and it feels it helps us pretty much. Um but yes. not sure if we can give it yeah. to him. Yeah, uh, just make sure that whatever he's having, he already, that food he had before, so it's not new, because it's very potent when it's a juice. So just like you're introducing things slowly into his system, uh, the first food of something shouldn't be in the juice form. It should be like this, the whole food, because it's so potent. Uh, yeah. Yes, he could have juicing, for sure. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Welcome. He got so big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and heavy. <laughs> it's all the chicken that he gets in the broth. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, who else has questions? Anyone else? Anyone else? Last call. I know it's eleven thirty, but I'm well, happy. On the, on the juices, Can, yes. do you recommend yes. celery juice, or is that just like? Oh. Um, oh, I love that question. Celery juice is having a very hot moment. It is. It is so popular. <laughs> Wow, I am not a huge giant fan of the medical medium because he says eggs are bad. I completely disagree. I don't know where this information came from. I looked everywhere. I cannot <laughs> find it. I have no idea. It's made up, right? This is, yeah. I firmly stand my, I think eggs are bad when they're created by chickens that were in very poor environments, yeah. were fed garbage, yeah. and are unhappy and have no nutritional value. And it's, then they're like dipped in chlorine. That's that's bad, but eggs. Yeah. Well, that's that's regular eggs. Um, get eggs from your local farmers market. Make yeah. sure they're it's so easy. Yeah, eggs are excellent foods. They're very good. We'll stick very with the eggs. Good. Uh, so, so that's the egg thing. That's why I can't take him seriously. I actually yeah. returned his books. I bought them and I like went and I'm like, return. I cannot look at this. Yeah, I did the but same thing. I really love that he's bringing awareness to, in general, like a healthier yeah. lifestyle. And that makes me happy. Yeah. Um, And he's all about celery juice. Celery juice is amazing. I love it. I feel like a million bucks when I drink celery juice is my favorite. Celery juice has a lot of nutrients. It's so good for hydration. It has magnesium. It's amazing. Uh. So does everything else. So that's why having a variety of different pro produce, greens, veggies, what's most important is not trying to get celery and juicing that. It's trying to get produce that is local because mm. it's picked when it, if possible, because it's picked when it's ripe and it has the most nutritional value. Produce that is organically grown and not just grown hydroponically with no soil. That's also important. Okay. So many of the produce that we see, greens, they, they literally, these things have never seen sunlight or soil. They're grown in a solution of liquid in a building. It's called hydroponic. It could be organic because chemicals don't need to be organic. I'm a little worried about that. Yeah. <laughs> Just so you know, you could literally make food for plants to grow in a liquid form by chemicals in a lab and then put lamps all over it and it will grow but it's never seen sunlight or soil <sighs> okay that's all i'm just oh so God. look into that so okay. more, more importantly than trying to get for juicing or for food in general it's more important to try to find high quality local produce than trying to find oh, like i heard celery is good but it doesn't it's not like or whatever let's call right. it i heard xyz veggie is so good. I'm going to buy it at all costs. It's so expensive. It was flown here from God knows where. And I have it now, but it was it has like no nutritional value whatsoever. Um, so that's the thing with fads and trends. Mm -hmm. which is not, I'm like very annoyed by those things. Got uh, it. Where do you live? I live in Seattle. Oh, okay, okay. So it's like nothing's growing. <laughs> Right. We're in California for a month, though. Oh, so good. <laughs> so you have a lot of options in California. Yeah. All right. So I hope, Thank yeah, you. I hope that helps. You're welcome. Um, let's see. Lauren, do you have another question? Uh, hold on. I think you're still muted. Okay. Um, I think you have to unmute yourself. Can you? Okay. Now I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Can you? Okay. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm driving, but you could hear me? 
Yes. Okay. Um, so, cause I did eliminate gluten and sugar, I would say by 80%. Um, and I did see, I see a drastic difference on her face. Um, drastic difference. Um, now on the weekends we cheat, um, you know, she will go to a birthday party and I let her have the pizza, um, dessert. I, I, give her a safe dessert gluten-free because she also has a uh, anaphylactic nut allergy so she's used to getting her own dessert but um you know she will also cheat she'll have a bagel on the weekend so by us cheating on the weekends with her diet uh am i like going forward and then going backwards and like should I not be doing is is that the wrong approach <laughs> if you saw a drastic difference when you eliminated 85 percent of it you probably want to yeah. continue in that very very good direction and try to be not making just for a while not making um the birthday stuff happen too much okay. because you already know yeah. what helps this is a really good place to be if you already know what's helping so try right. to be a little bit, just like maybe for like a month, a little bit more strict with it. Okay. Eventually okay. the body is able to rebalance itself. Once the inflammation is gone, once you stop feeding the candida, things will, the goal is not for her to be restricted forever and she won't be. Right. Right. But sometimes it takes. Okay. Should I be? Yeah. Oh, no, you, you, that's okay. Yeah, oh, so what were you going to say? It's like a, a loop that the body is like kind of stuck in. Like kids who get pneumonia uh -huh. all the time every with every cold. They're kind of stuck in this loop. Every time she's having sugar, maybe she's going to flare. That loop is going to... Homeostasis will be restored. The body's natural um, ability to balance itself out does get restored if you stop overwhelming it. Okay. All right. Um, that's helpful. Should should I also be eliminating soy or is soy okay? So so soy beans were like fermented. No. Soy? No soy soy like it like if it's if it's an ingredient in like for instance her waffles that she has for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, um, it's not pretty great. much every morning. No no take it out. It's like it's a very highly processed GMO food. It's not. Oh. She needs okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. It, it's like an ingredient, like it's gluten-free, organic, dairy-free, you know, it's the nature's test. Right. So the gluten-free stuff that's pre-packaged and processed is usually full yeah. of things you don't want. Okay. Yes. There's options. Like you could get, where do you live, Lauren? Um, Long Island, oh, yeah, New York. Okay. Uh, there, I mean, there are really good options, like, like I have this local place near me um, that is like a, they do like delivery to your house and they basically make frozen like pancake waffle mix, but it's just like, you can make it yourself. It's just like, oh, it's basically oats. And, mm -hmm. and then I make it with like my own honey and it's basically oats and like buckwheat. You can make it yourself mm -hmm. and then you could actually like put it together as like a waffle mix and have it ready. You don't need all that processed stuff from waffles and pancakes. And then you just throw fruit in there and then sweeten it with honey after that if you want to, just a little bit, because you're trying to mm -hmm. eliminate most sugar and that that's it. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Drive safe. Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> Yep, real quick. Um, what about like pure maple syrup that we get some from like a local yeah, farm? Oh, yeah, near I just us? answered you. Yeah, online too. Oh, like, okay. Posting in there that helps a lot of families. I get that question a lot. Most maple syrup in the US is actually very processed. That's not what you think it is. But if you really know that it's pure maple syrup from like locally made, they don't add any chemicals, they don't any add any extra sugar. Um I think that would would work well. Okay. Yeah, in moderation, of course. Okay. Yep. Thank um, you. Yes. Uh, Orvija asked a question on, um, in the chat box. Can we do wet wraps every day when eczema is flared up? Yes, you can if it's improving your child's skin. 
Um, yeah, answered that. Yeah, let's see. Oh, is tofu okay? As as you oh yeah, good question. Tofu is okay. Make sure it's organic. Tofu. Um, so that's not GMO soy. Um, and dates are great, and you can make your own date syrup. There's a recipe in in uh look up dates inside the eczema rescue digital program inside the search box and you'll see my this amazing dates homemade date syrup recipe that just uses dates to make a sweetener that's just fruit it's amazing better than most sweeteners uh Paula diet to help detoxing from mold I have to get back to you on that Paula that's a hard that's a that's a tough question. I sorry, I called on you earlier, but you weren't answering. So, um, I actually don't. I don't have a specific diet for you, but I'd like to look into mold a little bit more and let you know. Um, yeah, let 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 me get back to you, Paula. Um, maybe you could also post it inside the group. Um, so I can kind of that's where I keep my it's like my homework, and I'll get back to you on that. That's a really good question. So, and I I know that you recently did a test about it. Um, to see that there's mold and I know there's some, some supplements that I wanted to add on there like walnut shells and to help uh, those kinds of um, processes so just would you, if you don't mind posting inside the group that would be really helpful so I could do a little homework for you um, all right so any other last questions before we go okay uh, thank you so much, everyone. The next time we will be meeting live is going to be on February 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern. If you miss any of the lives, I'll post them in the group. And if you have any questions between sessions, please post them in the group so I can answer them. So we could all answer them. Thank you so, so much, everybody, for coming in so early. I hope everyone has a really, really, really beautiful day ahead. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>